Hey everyone, welcome to the Doctors of Running podcast, where we, a group of doctors of physical therapy, talk about the art and the science of the things we put on our feet. Today, it is Andrea and I going to talk about some really cool stuff today regarding master's runners and a little bit of what I'm finding with my dissertation. But we're also going to talk about a lot of our clinical experiences, since I think I can speak for both of us, a large portion of our population that we treat are often master's runners. So um, I don't know where we want to go from here. Um, Andre, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Okay. I'm doing good. Yeah. This is perfect. We both had nice uh, long runs earlier today, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Long runs. Cognitive abilities are a little depressed at the moment, so there might be yeah. some odd pauses in here, but we'll have to see. <laughs> so when, so I'm obviously I'm a little biased with this because my clinical experience is since I really enjoy working with older athletes, um, and that's a lot of the masters runners out there, or a lot of the runners out there are typically, and we've seen this from some of the research recently that that's actually the largest growing group among runners, right? Of all age groups and some of like the thirties, forties, your twenties, you're seeing some slight decreases in, in participation, but going 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, that those groups are actually increasing by the greatest amount. So starting question, Andrew, as I'm curious, what are your experiences with masters runners and masters athletes? Cause you can also say that with cycling and some other areas. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I see a ton of masters athletes, both cyclists and runners. And I would say one of the biggest things is as we get older, we get more life responsibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Like when we're in our teens and 20s, maybe a collegiate athlete or maybe just starting our careers, we don't have as many outside responsibilities that can either eat into our training time or affect how we feel when we're training. So a master's athlete is more likely to have a job where they're sitting at a desk all day or on their feet all day. They might have kids, they might be taking care of other family members and all of that other non running or cycling stuff can affect how they feel when they're doing their sport. So whenever, and I apply this to any patient, not just master's runners, but if someone comes in with a pain, let's say when they're running, you don't just talk about the running, but you also talk about, well, what do you spend your time outside of running doing? Because if they're sitting at a desk for 10 hours a day, and maybe their desk is their couch because they've been working from home because of the pandemic, then that could be contributing to their hamstring pain or their hip flexor tightness or whatever. Um, similarly, let's say you have somebody who has little kids at home. Well, if you're always carrying your baby or your toddler on the same side, well, that's going to create some imbalances in your body that could affect how you feel when you're running. Um, so I would encourage all, not just PTs, but other medical providers, like always consider your patient's full experience, not just related to their sport, because often you can find the key, so the key part or contributing factor to their problem outside of what they're doing for their sport. Um, how about you, Matt? What have you noticed with your master's athletes? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Sometimes it's kind of like they, they have the same mentality a lot of times for, because a lot of the ones in Southern California are very elite. I'm very fortunate to be in the birthplace of master's athletics, which is San Diego and Los Angeles. So we have some really fast and talented individuals here who have repeatedly beat me in road races. I, I got to give a shout out to Pete McGill, who, when I was in PT school, first coming down here, he beat me in a 5k and I didn't race. And he was, he was over 50 at that time. He had just set the US 50, uh, 5k record. and It was like 1440 something for awesome. over 50. And it was awesome. I didn't know that at the time. And he just, he out leaned me at a race and I did, didn't race for three months because I was so upset <laughs> that this individual was almost double my age, just like whooped me at the line. Um, uh, John Gardner is another really awesome guy from Cal coast, uh, who is in his, I think he's should be 50 now, but is a multiple time, like us champion has done all this great stuff for cross country and track. But it's, it's interesting talking with them because you, you still get some of that, like, kind of like your high school mentality. You're like, I'm just going to train hard. I'm going to do this. But mm -hmm. then you get the other aspect of the season learning where they're like, I'm just starting to figure this out. So it's cool because they're all, a lot of them are still really fast. They're extremely mm -hmm. competitive. You got to watch it. If you don't make sure you lean at the line, you'll get beat like I did. <laughs> um, but at the same time, their, their bodies are changing 
and it's very important. They're aware of it, and there's a lot of wisdom that comes with this. And that's what's really cool about getting to work with Masters athletes that as a younger run, well, I can't say as young anymore, um, but as a runner who's kind of going and studying what happens as we age, they have a lot of wisdom. But there's also going to be a lot of frustration and patience required because our bodies are different, right? They're not the same as when they were, you know, running in high school and college. And that takes some adaptation and treating these awesome athletes also take some knowledge of what's happening to our bodies as a chain, kind of changing. I'm going to be careful with how I say this next phrase, changing expectations as it comes to recovery time. Cause that tends to get a little bit longer, but it's not that you can't perform at a high level. It's just, you have to kind of come at things a little differently. And this is not meant to be limiting is how I'm saying is, is there's some things you might have to adapt to to make sure that you are performing at the highest level and many of the, the the runners that i've either gotten to know or gotten to work with have continually demonstrated that that you can still perform at incredibly high levels but how you train kind of needs to, you, you have less room for mistakes is how right. john gardner would tell me he's like i got i guess le got less wiggle room for doing dumb stuff like i really got to be definitely on top of this yeah when you're 20 you can do a lot of dumb stuff and feel yeah. fine the next day but when you're 40 or 60 there is definitely less uh, right. room for error there you gotta be a yeah, little I think more careful yeah one of the things that really comes with um having more experience in a sport and increasing age is just wisdom about your body and i think that component of being a master's athlete can help people continue to pour, perform their best despite the changes that come with aging right so as any athlete, you learn to pay attention to what your body is telling you, like signs that maybe you need another recovery day or feeling like, oh, maybe an injury is coming on. I need to back off a little bit. The longer you're in your sport and, you know, we'll just talk about running here, you you just get better at listening to the messages that your body sends you. And as you get older, those messages change and you might learn like, oh, I really need four days between hard workouts instead of two or three, like I did when I was 20 or 25. Or I need to spend a little more time doing like non-running stuff, like foam rolling, soft tissue work, strength training, so that when I do run, I get the most out of my body. Or when I was 20, I could roll out of bed at 4 a.m., put on my shoes and go run and feel fine. Whereas now you actually need to like warm up a little, maybe walk a little, maybe do some mobility work before you head out the door. So I think it's awesome talking to masters athletes because yeah. you can learn so much from them. Um, I'm not quite a master's athlete yet, but I will be next year. So, you know, I've certainly learned over the course of my running and cycling career, just how to listen to my body better and to respect like where I'm at. I don't train the same as I did when I was 22, but I'm running faster than I did when I was 22. So the more any athlete can learn to listen to their body and just kind of give yourself some grace and some wiggle room to not train the same way you did 20 years ago, the better your performance is gonna be. So that's, that's actually a great segue into our because what you're mentioning is going, hey, there's some things that you've noticed that are changing. So here's two things I want to do. For our subjective question, this actually relates directly into this. So it's going, what, for all of our listeners, our, our readers, our watcher, our viewers, what is something that you've noticed change about your body with increasing age? And if you know, what have you done about it? And I think that's a great segue into this next section. Just to, op first of all, operationally define what is a master's runner? And then talk about how the two of us, because we, our age ranges, despite being on the younger end, we have still gone past a couple periods that I want to talk about where some changes start to happen. So just to operationally define what a master's runners is, the USA Track and Field Association op defines this as anyone over the age of 35 to 40, depending on who you're talking about. I believe road running um, is 40 and then track and field usually 35, which I totally disagree with, but that's another topic. Um, 
that anything over that is considered a master's athlete or master's runner, meaning that you're going to start having individual age group championships, individual, like kind of better, like more specified age group areas for competition and, and competing and all that kind of stuff. So I, I, I personally, I'm just going to throw this out there based on some of the stuff I'm seeing in the literature. Uh, so as we can dive into what actually happens after the age of 30, there are some musculoskeletal changes that will happen. That's kind of that first around that area. You're going to start seeing some things change, adapt, that kind of stuff. The other two times that this really starts to accelerate is at age 50 and at age 75, which is why I kind of think that masters athletics really shouldn't start until like 45 to 50, because based on the evidence, that's where we really start to see changes, but they do start happening earlier. So Andrea, what, what changes have you noticed since you've gone past 30? Hmm. Um, definitely longer recovery time. Um, I need to do more mobility work. Like I love my hypervolt and my foam roller and I see a massage therapist a couple times a month. Um, I'm definitely better at paying attention to like the little messages my body's sending me and going and seeing one of my PT colleagues for a little tune up before it turns into like a bigger problem. Um, like we talked about earlier, I just can't do stupid stuff anymore. Right. Like I remember maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it, I would run in the off season after like the cycling season was over. And my husband was like, oh, why don't you go do this really hilly route near our house? And it was probably like eight miles with like 900 feet of climbing and a couple climbs that average like 10% for like a mile or more. And I was like, okay. So I went and did it and you know, my calves were sore for like 12 hours and then I was fine. I wouldn't go do that now without having done like some serious hill training prior to that. Um, you, you have to gradually prepare your body for new things like that. Not just, oh yeah, I'll go do that. No problem. Um, I think you and I have talked about, uh, both perhaps wanting to do the run up Mount Washington someday, which for listeners who don't know, it's a, a 7.6 mile paved climb that averages 12%. Um, so if I were to decide to do that, I wouldn't just do the same training that I've been doing. I would include a lot of long, steep hills and I would introduce them gradually to help my body adapt because it takes longer to adapt as I've gotten older and it takes longer to recover. How about you? What have you noticed? I know that you're not quite as old as me, um, but you've probably noticed some changes since you were in, you know, high school and undergrad. Yeah, the the changes came at me pretty quick, which also inspired the dissertation. So <laughs> the, the 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 listeners are going to probably be able to figure this out. And so I, I often challenge my students because they'll often ask me like, "How old are you?" And I'm like, "I'm not going to tell you because then you're going to figure it out and realize that we're about the same age, and that <laughs> you're not going to listen to me as much." But so you'll be able to figure it out if you look at my race results. So I am coming up on being 32. I will probably be 32 by the time this this actually airs. Um, but even still, I started noticing some changes around 29 and 30 and I'm like, oh, this is not quite what I remember. And it's exactly what you said, where it takes longer to recover. Um, there are kind of more things that pop up and I'll, I'll kind of talk, address really quickly and I'll come back to this at the very end where I kind of think where we need to make sure we address, but just cert there's more, more stuff required in terms of some of the strength work, some of the mobility work to really keep performing at a certain level. The other thing I've just noticed is I don't, it, again, the recovery time, I can't, especially right now with what's on my plate, I can't do the same big workouts I did. It affects me cognitively and it affects me physically like for a couple of days. Yeah. So one of the things I've switched is instead of doing these big, massive workouts, I'll do kind of little stuff. Like I still do lots of hill repeats, like hill strides, stuff like that, because I, I've noticed as soon as I stop, hills get so much harder than they used to. And we'll talk about some things that might make that make sense. But yeah, the recovery time, fitness kind of takes a little bit longer to build, which is good because it taught me patience. I just realized the other day, I'm like, I'm actually enjoying this time. It's like kind of like getting back into shape, like slowly pushing mm -hmm. this that I have time and there's not so much pressure. So also I don't race as much. I think it's because just self-conscious. So like, I don't know, because it's been so long, I don't know what it's going to look like. So eventually mm -hmm. I'll, I'll weigh myself in there. But the recovery time and being more careful with what I choose to do is definitely that kind of thing. Cause I, I'm yeah. very, we're very lucky as PTs and I've gotten really good at learning how to manage stuff and like 
head stuff off very quickly as soon as I feel it. But that also comes from experience going, all right, is this just soreness or is this beginning to become a little irritation that I really need to get on? And I have to say one of the biggest changes I've made that's made such a huge difference is really hitting strength work. So I, I've talked about this before that I have really heavy kettlebells, which the poor male people that had to deal with this. So I have two fifty pound kettlebell, two seventy five kettlebells, and then two hundred pound kettlebells. And messing with those a couple times a week and doing a lot of like single leg stuff and heavy stuff, not tons of reps, but like short reps, and only takes me about fifteen minutes to do, has made the biggest change because I could feel myself losing strength and it's made a big impact coming back. And I think hopefully as we talk about some of the things, some some of our listeners might be inspired to do, again, you don't have to go do an hour and a half in the gym, but you kind of got to need to start about, think about some of these other things for maintenance and preservation of function. And yeah, it's, it's been a good, good tool, but let's, so let's dive into a little bit of the background. So hopefully this gives a little foundation to go. Yes. I started this dissertation going, I am noticing these changes. I'd like to know what's happening for myself, obviously, most selfishly, but also for a lot of the athletes that I have treated and a lot of the individuals who have been, I've been really lucky that I've gotten to treat some U.S. national level masters swimmers in Southern California through Kaiser. I've gotten to treat, obviously, a lot of masters runners who've been nice enough to reach out to me and gotten to experience that. So seeing what we're kind of moving towards me go, I got to figure out why, because believe it or not, there was not a ton of evidence about there are there's there's evidence about changes in older individuals but when you talk about masters runners or masters athletes there's not a ton of stuff and so what you're going to hear a lot of the listeners you're going to you're going to walk away from this going oh why is this happening we're like we don't know yet so andrew i sent andrew a bunch of stuff before that and she goes what do you think's happening I'm like, yeah. <laughs> no that's why i'm trying to do this so just so people know, again, I mentioned some of those age-related changes that happen at certain age points. So 30 is kind of where a lot of the stuff starts. 50 and 75 is where 50 and 70 is where they start to really accelerate. Um, doesn't mean you can't adapt to them because there is no age that you stop adapting to exercise. You just have to know that those adaptations are are specific to that. So there's, I just want to shout out a couple people that I've gotten to know over the years. I mentioned Pete McGill, who is the US 5K record holder for the 50 plus division. He ran like 14, 40 something. John Gardner is a really awesome individual down here that I know, um, who's also been, I don't know if he's got any records yet, but he's definitely been a multiple time champion at, at the variety of distances. Uh, Nolan Shahid was a really awesome individual. He is a professional jazz player and US record holder for the 800 and the 1500 and mile. He's run a 453 mile at age 60. I forget it was like 63, wow. 64. Um, so it was really cool to watch that. Um, and then I get to I got to meet Gene Dykes um, oh my when my gosh. wife was running the uh, U.S. 50K championships, and he set the U.S. 50K or the yeah the U.S. 50K record for this like 70 plus division. And it was just it was incredible. He's run a 254 something marathon, and this is all above 70. So he's kind of putting a challenge toward Ed Whitlock, who was kind of the previous right. like world record holder for a lot of those. And I apologize that I don't know any of the other like the the female record holders. I feel like I I should, but these are oh well, the, I yeah. do. <laughs> do you do? Okay, uh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, a woman who lives not far from me, uh, Heather Knight Peck. She actually coached me last year. Um, she broke Joan Benoit Samuelson's Boston oh, wow. record uh, earlier this year. I think she ran a 302 or a 303. She's 60. And she got her marathon PR at age like 57 or 58. She Sweet. ran a three flat at Indy. And she's still getting faster. So, you know, I think one thing that's really important to mention here is when we talk about age-related changes, like you said, a lot of, actually, the vast majority of research is on non-athletes. Right. And the changes that are seen in non-athletes are not going to be as pronounced, well, they're going to be as pro more pronounced as compared to athletes. One of the main reasons people lose strength and VO2 max and other things that we see with aging is because they stop exercising. Right. So... If you've been a lifelong athlete and you maintain like your mileage or your weekly duration, you keep doing strength work, maybe tweaking it a little bit, you're not going to, you're not doomed. You're not going to lose, you know, strength and endurance and speed 
the way that sedentary people do. So, and it's also really inspirational to know people like Heather, to know people like, you know, who are setting, like Heather, PRs in their late 50s and 60s, or like still being really, really fast into their 70s and even 80s. So, you know, I try not to get too like wrapped up in how old yeah. I am, but you know, it's easy when you're reading research yeah. like this to think, oh, like, when is, you know, age coming for me? When am I going to stop getting right. faster? But the point is, yes, we're all going to slow down a little, but we have control over how much we slow down. Right. And the main key is continuing to be active. Right. And that's really important. So, and I, I really, I'm really glad you brought that up because again, our, our, this conversation not is, is not to bring fear. It's like, oh, the, you know, cause we're talking about changes stuff, right? Right. But it's to go, hey, you, you should be a little bit more aware. Here's some of the changes that are happening. Here's how you might be able to address them, which actually goes great into our next part was going, yes, there, there are these, these incredible people are still running very quick. A lot of them are still PRing in ages where, you know, most people would say, hey, this is time to hang up your shoes. And that's unfortunately what happens, by the way, in medicine quite a bit. I was really, I, I didn't, I wasn't looking forward to this initially, but did what's called a qualitative analysis. Um, a qualitative type study, which is where, you know, quantitative means you're taking, taking data, right. And you're, t you're got numbers, stuff like that. Qualitative is exploring the experiences so of, of individuals and groups. So I was exploring the experiences of master's athletes in healthcare. And one of the things that they were repeatedly experiencing was a lot of stereo stereotyping. So it just, I, I interviewed like five or six different people. And the, the, I kept hearing the same thing over and over where they, you know, fifties, sixties, seventies, one of the individuals was about ready to set, I think the US, I forget which race distance. It was one of the shorter like sprint distances. And he, he had was about ready to, he, the next week is when he did this. He went to go see his primary care doc. And he's like, hey, you know, this kind of thing has been bugging me. And the guy was like, why are you still running? Like you should have hung this up a while ago. And he's literally the next week he went and set US record for that distance. And he's like, yeah. That's terrible. So I really want it for anybody in, in medicine that's listening to this, please do not stereotype. Please ask and understand the individual sitting in front of you because everybody's going to be different. And that's a classic thing a lot of people have told me going, yeah, I just ran like 20 miles a day before and I go to go to the hospital just to get like a checkup and they're asking me, do I want a walker? And it's like, <laughs> no, I ran 20 miles yesterday. Like, I don't think you understand me. So just know that, again, some of the stereotypes can be really difficult, but please, we encourage people don't make those stereotypes and also know that's not you, right? You can, right. you can change these things. There are things that are changing in your body, but know that you can't, we, there's research that suggests that even into the, like hundreds, like late nineties, you can adapt to exercise, you can change things. And that's even among, so there's some early evidence on older athletes being able to also adapt to different stimuli because yep. as Andrea mentioned, some of the, we, you can maintain VO2 max, you can maintain strength, but those, those maintenance or those improvements are specific to the type of exercise you do. So, uh, I encourage anyone that's really interested in this. McKendry is a really put out a really good article in 2018 on some of the musculoskeletal changes that happen in masters athletics, not just runners, but everybody. And obviously you see some strength changes, you see VO2 max changes, but it's dependent on what you're doing. So masters strength athletes. So like the weightlifters, powerlifters, they maintain their strength and they maintain a lot of muscle mass. They maintain a lot of function, which is great. More of the endurance athletes, so the cyclists and runners tend to maintain their VO2 max really, really well. Now, the other thing, right, that they weren't working on, they did tend to see some decreases in, which makes sense. If you don't use it, you lose it. So for both athletes, I really suggest if there's something you're not, you're not working on, it might not be a bad idea to put just a little, little bit, right? Because a little can go a long way. There are also some changes that do happen. So we know that so far there are some injury differences, right? There's injury types and rate differences specifically among masters runners. And we still haven't figured out why, which is what my dissertation is about. So we do know that when you're younger, right? So under like 35, 40, the more this is, there's always variability, but the more common injuries you're going to see is injuries at the knee. So patellofemoral issues, IT band issues, kind of that realm. <coughs> <laughs> and then your esophagus doesn't work. Um, as you get older, that seems to change, right? So that it seems like the number one injury that we do see as you get older is Achilles tendinopathy. The second thing is calf strains. And then the third thing is hamstring strains. Why? 
We really don't know. We just know that there's different injury types. And we also know the rates of injury tend to increase a little bit. So about 40 to 46% of younger runners tend to get injured. 49% of older runners tend to get injured every year. So it's just a little difference, but it seems to be significant that that's a little bit higher. Again, why? That's what we're trying to figure out. So it seems like for whatever reason that calf Achilles tends to be a really high area. And that's, it was interesting when I reached out to some people in Southern California, Hey, I'm doing this. I'm going to be setting the study up in a couple months. Like, do you know of anybody that might have this? And they're like, yeah, all of us have this when you're ready to recruit, let us know. Cause we want to know why we're all getting Achilles <laughs> issues. And I was like, Oh great. Cause I've already had this as a you know, 32 year old. I've already had this multiple times. I'm like, Oh great. This is where I'm going. So you know, just trying to figure this out. So I'm, I'm curious, is that, have you seen that in a lot of the athlete, the masters yes. training, treated? Yeah. Like to a T actually, yeah. like the vast majority are Achilles tendinopathy is not like acute, but like the chronic, right. um, tendinosis, um, calf strains, hamstring tendinopathy, very rarely knee, except yeah. for people who have like a preexisting injury. Right. Um, and I think, you know, as we get into the systematic review that we wrote, uh, that you wrote and see the like biomechanical changes that occur in masters runners, mm -hmm. it kind of makes sense why they might be more likely to have calf and hamstring injuries as opposed to knee injuries because of some of those biomechanical changes. Right. So, it's... oh, go ahead. No, go for it. Um, well, I was just going to say, so for our viewers who haven't picked up on this, Matt is working on his PhD and he wrote a systematic review on the biomechanical changes in masters runners. And he's also working on a, another research project for his dissertation where he looks at um, specifically Achilles tendinopathy in masters runners. So we're going to talk a lot about um, what Matt found in his systematic review, how he's planning on setting up his Achilles tendinopathy study. So Matt, um, Tell our viewers, because, you know, the medical people who are listening should know, but what is a systematic review? Yeah, so a systematic review is a type, it's a, it's a research study of research studies. So what a systematic review attempts to do is synthesize all the available evidence. Because you if you look out there, you can find a study that has found one thing, and you can find another study that's found something else. A systematic review attempts to take all the available literature and combine it and going, all right, when we've combined all this stuff and we've t looked at the quality of these studies, we've looked at the, like the level of evidence here, what's kind of the consensus? What is when you bring everything together, what is it looking like? And I'm really glad I did this, even though it took months and months and months. One of my, one of my professors, before I did this, I was like, I'm going to get this done really quick. And he's like, ah, this is going to take you like six to eight months, if not more. And I was like, <laughs> nah, and it totally did. It, it's, these are really hard. They take a lot of time. You got to, you, I've spent hours, day, months, going through the literature, searching for stuff. And what I found actually went exactly against what I found previously because my previous experience, I was only looking at one or two classic articles. And then when I brought everything together, I'm like, oh, that's not actually what the consensus is. So the, my initial thought was, oh, you know, master's runners, they lose range of motion. They have a higher stride rate, their cadence increases, their stride rate decreases all the joint motion decreases. You think, you, you know, you're stereotypical. And I said, don't stereotype, right? But you're like right. hobbling older individual, which by the way, is how <laughs> I look every single morning. So I'm, and I have looked like that since I was 18. So <laughs> my wife makes fun of me, but like just that decreased range of motion, decreased loading, that kind of stuff. And I expected from some of those articles for there to actually be increased joint loading at the ankle. Cause I thought, oh, that mm -hmm. must be why the Achilles is getting irritated. So systematic review takes all the, and you have to, it's a systematic way. So I had to set up how I was going to look through the literature. I have to basically, basically create a paper trail and a, a process of going, here's how I'm going to look. And it needs to be evidence-based and, and, you know, this is going to be submitted hopefully in the next week or two. Um, but it takes a lot of work and it has to be again, systematic. You can't just do this randomly. These are very different from what would be a narrative review where people are just talking and saying, Hey, you know, this is what my, I've seen and this kind of stuff. It's very different from that. It is a research study of research. So what I found was actually very different than I was expecting, which I expected all mechanics to change. 
I expected there to be higher impact forces at the ankle. I expected there to be a higher cadence and a lower, uh, a shorter stride length. Only part of that was true. What I actually found was that at the knee joint, things didn't change. There was no difference in older compared to younger runners in joint loading in range of motion. A lot of that stuff was fairly similar. There's a couple, a couple studies that were kind of like, Hey, it seems to decrease, but the majority are like, yeah, there's no difference. The hip, there was some mechanical changes, right? And they said, you know, Hey, for whatever reason, the total joint range of motion decreases, but for whatever reason, people are getting more hip extension than when they're younger. And I was like, that's weird. But I kept seeing this over and over again. I was like, huh? All right. And it's more hip extension at the, the second part of the stance phase where your foot's on the ground. When it came to the ankle, this is the biggest surprise. There was the same joint range of motion. It wasn't different. It was not, there was the same plantar flexion, dorsal flexion, which was very surprising compared to young, younger athletes and the joint loading. So all the ground reaction forces, all that stuff was much lower. And I was expecting it to be higher. Cause I was like, well, you don't have, you know, we know that calf strength tends to decrease in older individuals and older runners, but it's decreasing. That's weird. So it almost seems like, and again, this is not confirmed that masters runners have figured out a way to protect their ankle and they don't actually have different cadences. There was some articles that said that, yes, they have a slightly higher cadence, but other ones go, no, it's actually pretty much the same. There's no statistical difference between younger and older runners. So stride length though, does decrease and stride length. It was very significant repeatedly in a lot of studies. We do know though that. Interestingly enough, as I've discovered, is that stride length is heavily determined by your calf strength and how much you're pushing off there, which that kind of makes sense. It's just surprising. I would expect them to compensate for that for a little bit more with a higher cadence. But we also know that when you use a higher cadence, you also need to have more hamstring strength. You need to have more activation there. You need a little bit more speed, which as we get older, the ability to generate force quickly is something that you, you can lose if you don't work on. So it's, you got kind of all these pieces here, but it seems like the biggest changes are happening at the ankle where you've got decreased calf strength and you're, and they are decreasing the loads at the ankle. So they seem to be protecting it. They're still getting Achilles tendinopathy for some reason and the hip, they're actually increasing their range of motion into hip extension, but their stride length is changing outside of that. A lot of the other things aren't changing, which was really surprising. It is really interesting how the body figures out like the best compensatory strategy mm -hmm. at a given time, right? So like you said, we don't really know why all of these things happen, but for whatever constellation of factors, masters athletes tend to demonstrate these biomechanical changes, which must be the most efficient running pattern for them right. at that given time. So whether it's well, we know loss of calf strength. I think we also know that um, the Achilles tendon loses its stiffness with age. Yes. So perhaps, and again, research has not proven this, but we're just speculating here. Perhaps that combination leads to a greater risk for Achilles tendonopathy if you've got a tendon that's less stiff, whereas in younger runners, the Achilles tendon really helps with um, rate of force development helps with right. push off. Um, in, well, in Greek mythology, the Achilles tendon of course yeah. was like the weak link, right? But perhaps right. as masters runners age, it also becomes the weak link because of that loss of stiffness. That's very possible. And we, uh, the challenge is we don't know what's, this is a chicken or the egg scenario because we know that as, as people get older, this has, this research hasn't been done in masters runners though. We know a lot of older individuals as, as age increases, their tendons change. So yeah, they lose elasticity. So a lot of the, 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 a lot of the tendon actually gets replaced with tissue. That's non-contractile tissue. That's right. not really elastic anymore. So that's where you can lose some elasticity. But the other issue is, so the other problem is that the elasticity, of the tendon can impact calf strength. So if that's not elastic, the amount of force you can produce decreases. The challenge yeah. is we also have seen that there is a decrease in force output, whether it's power, strength, right? It, there's a decrease in calf strength, which can also affect the elasticity of the tendon. It's just, we don't know which right. one's it's happening. It's a circle. First. Yeah. You know, no idea, right? Yeah. So that kind of makes it challenging to go. That's, that's where my dissertation came from is going, wait, we really don't know. And that, to be honest, we are not at the stage 
to start doing interventional studies. We mm-hmm. don't know enough to go, hey, you know what? Let's do this exercise. It's like, mm-hmm. there's still too many questions, which is why my study is going to be what's called observational, where I'm not any any of the wonderful individuals that come volunteer for my study. You just know you're not going to be doing any like strength stuff. We're going to be looking at what your strength is and what your, your movement patterns are between those with and without Achilles tendinopathy. But we don't know enough yet. That's hopefully after the dissertation, but after I finish, but like we, we're going to have some ideas for you, but the evidence isn't clear enough yet about what really should be done treatment wise. And that's, what's hard with prevention stuff and research. But I'm curious, what do you, is there anything else that you think might be contributing to this? Well, when you talk about, so what could be contributing to loss of calf strength in older runners? So we know that vena vein function changes mm-hmm. as we get older. People are more likely to get venous insufficiency, swelling in their calves. I mean, just anecdotally, think about all the runners that you see wearing calf sleeves or compression yep. stockings when they're running. It tends to be the older runners. Yep. Um, you know, we see Kira D'Amato racing in them. She's yep. my age, I think. She's amazing. Um, so I think... If a person has venous insufficiency, there's certainly a likelihood that that could impact their calf strength. Um, There's probably neurological changes as we get older. um, The transmission of our peripheral nerves can change Mm -hmm. and that can reduce the contractility of our muscles. So perhaps there's something about the peripheral nerves to the lower leg that are more susceptible to those age related changes. Again, I don't know and I don't think anyone knows, but it's a possibility. Um, Also, when you talk about masters runners, just from sheer life experience, you are more likely to have had a previous injury that affects your running biomechanics. Um, Let's say you had a bad ankle sprain and you never got normal range of motion back or it was a really bad sprain, so you've got some ligamentous laxity and maybe some instability. Well, because the body is such a good compensator, you can still run and feel pretty good, right? But something else, whether you realize it or not, is making up for like a slight loss of dorsiflexion range of motion or a slight loss of eversion range of motion. And over time, that could affect your strength, it could affect your hip mobility, it could affect your knee mobility. So let's say you've got a 60-year-old runner who has had an ankle sprain and a meniscal tear in their knee and hip bursitis and has some stenosis in their lumbar spine. Like the cumulative effects of all of those potentially subclinical problems could add up to a clinically noticeable change in running biomechanics. And that's why you know, I wasn't on this episode, but you guys talked about the importance of like a full body running Mm -hmm. evaluation. That's why it's so important because I was just talking to somebody about this the other day who has posterior tibialis tendinitis. If your treatment is only focused on the part of your body that hurts, it is probably not going to solve your problem unless you had some sort of like direct blow to that part of your body and it is truly like a localized inflammation or contusion. Otherwise, we all know that the body works as a unit, right? The hip influences the knee, influences the ankle. It's like that song. Um, So if you go to a PT and all they do is look at the part of your body that hurts, it is very unlikely that they're going to... 100% help you with your problem. So, and it becomes even more important when you talk about runners who are older, who probably have accumulated more of these things that maybe they got over, but they're still left with a little bit of a range of motion impairment or strength impairment or stability um, or ligamentous laxity. So I, with all of my patients, I always look head to toe. If you're coming in for your ankle, I might look at your neck. You never know. Um, But you've got to keep in mind the effects of non-local parts of the body on, for this example, calf weakness. Well, 
their calf weakness might be influenced by their lack of trunk rotation or might be influenced by the stenosis they have in their lumbar, lumbar spine. Maybe they don't have significant enough stenosis to cause symptoms, but maybe it's enough to slightly decrease the neural input to their calf muscles. There are so many things that potentially could contribute to the things that Matt found in his systematic review, and we just need more and more PhD yep. candidates and professors who can uh, try to tease all of this out. Um, do you have any thoughts about, like, for example, why do you think, just in your gut, that masters runners tend to lose calf strength? I, I, to be honest with you, I'm not sure just because there's so many factors that go in there. That's again, why my study is still observational. Cause I'm like, I don't yeah. know what to treat you. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a little bit easier, honestly, with an individual. So that's why for me, the subjective exam, where kind of hearing a person's story is so important because that, te right. that's part of the detective work to go, okay, you've had this, 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 okay, mm -hmm. here. And it's also understanding what we've talked about before. You know, our bodies are changing. Recovery times takes longer. An injury might just be, be because, you know what? You didn't take the time to enough space between workouts. You had life stress. You had all this other stuff that we've, we've talked about and mentioned that injuries, musculoskeletal injuries aren't always from musculoskeletal causes, right? Stress, nutrition, sleep, all this stuff can directly play into there. And it's something as a master's runner, you really got to pay attention to. And unfortunately, life doesn't always let you get away with that, you know, but that that is a really important part. I had a patient once tell me like, oh, man, getting getting old sucks. And I was like, you know, it just it takes a little bit more work. You know what? You, right. you don't give up. Right. Because it just it, you got to put a little bit more effort to go at kind of the speed you want to go. Yeah. And uh, one of the uh, Shirley Sarman, who I've gotten to talk to him and that she's a really awesome physical therapist who has been really, really powerful prof profession, always says aging is not for the weak of heart yes. at all. So. Yeah. It's, it's important, but to answer the question, I, my gut, my gut instinct in masters runners would be that again, because they don't work on a lot of strength stuff and a lot, especially endurance, because sprinters tend to maintain it better. A lot of distance mm -hmm. runners don't, right? How often, how good are we about doing strides or getting in the gym and doing some heavier stuff a couple times a week? Um, and I, I think oftentimes runners in general, don't work on the right things in the gym. They'll do your classic three sets of 10, whatever, which we know is really not specific enough that you want to be having, you're already working on endurance. I would be doing strength stuff, three, four sets of four to five reps of going something yep. heavier. Which again, why it only takes me like 15, 20 minutes to get through a quick routine where I'm kind of like loading stuff heavier, but I really think it's because we don't work on strength a lot. And that can be through things like hill repeats, which also have their own injury risks because people tend to overdo them. I, I, I think it really has to do with, yeah, not working on strength. Your endurance is good. And you can see that where these, these older endurance athletes are just killing like ultra marathons. Very oh, rarely yeah. do you see consistent <laughs> younger athletes winning. You maybe see them one time and then they're gone. It's mm -hmm. the old, it's the master runners that just like wipe the field out because their endurance is there. They've been working right. on it. Yeah. That strength component. Again, it's one of those. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. And I think that's kind of the big, the specific reason why I'm not sure, but big picture, I think it has to be, you got to make sure you work on strength because right. you will lose it if you don't use it. Yep. And that's a good segue into what we want to talk about next is so if you're a master's runner or if you're about to turn into a master's runner, right? How, what should your strength work look like and why? Like you just mentioned that like three sets of 10 doesn't work and that it's better to do like four to five sets of five. Yeah. So what is the reason for that? Yeah. So when it comes to exercise prescription, if, if you are seeing a medical professional, I give you three sets of 10, you should ask why. Because everything that you do has to have a purpose. Three sets of 10, if you're actually doing 10 reps, meaning that you get to 10, you can't do anything more, based on some evidence, although this is getting questions a little bit, that is kind of more of a hypertrophy based load, right? Meaning that you're going to get more muscle size, right? And again, some people's going to comment that the evidence actually recently has been a little, that's not as solid as we once thought. But again, you're training a little something a little bit different system, something you're kind of already working on, especially if you go higher, if you're going 20 reps, 30 reps, right? And this is assuming again, that you get to 20 or 30 reps and you can't do anymore. 
Right. That's the key. Mm-hmm. I, I've seen plenty of people, and I experienced when I was a new grad, where they'd be like, I'd say three sets of 10, and they'd do all 30 at once. He goes, that was easy. And I'm like, now I know that wasn't therapeutic at all. That was right. a waste of their time and a waste of my time. So yep. the reason I say lower reps, higher weight, is because if you want to induce these kind of changes, both in the tendon as well as the muscle, higher loads safely is key. Right, you want to do this. You don't need to do this fast right now because we've seen tendon and muscle changes with slower reps, and especially for tendinopathy, is what's called slow, heavy resistance training has had some really positive impacts on tendons, especially the Achilles. The old stuff was, oh, you need to do eccentrics, which is like those heel drops a billion times. We've actually found better results and better adherence and better outcomes with doing just. Go slow, right? Go a little heavier weight, load that tendon, give it some time to heal, which is why you don't need to do this every day, probably two, three times a week is most. But in terms of choosing exercises and choosing rep ranges, less is more, right? I would really say specifically if you're an endurance athlete, why would you be doing endurance strength training? Right. You're getting more of the same. None of us, like every runner doesn't want to bulk up, right? Unless right. you're a sprinter and maybe you do. So, but you can't. So, you... Right. Well, some people can. <laughs> right. You... Some, some people can, but if you're going to do those smaller reps and if you're running enough, like those systems, yeah. the hypertrophy or like size gaining or what is it? Am I gonna... Anabolic yep. is directly against what's called what running, which is catabolic, mean breaking things down versus building. So right. you're, you're not going to look like a bodybuilder. If you're no. running 80 miles a week, like good luck right. with that. I'd like to see it. I'm very interested, <laughs> but I don't think you're putting, you're not taking enough calories and that your biological systems aren't working enough to do that. Right. So the other thing um, to mention about like higher weight, lower reps is that really targets your neuromuscular response, mm-hmm. meaning it teaches your nervous system to increase the rate of force development of your muscle, which for runners, rate of force development is one of the most important concepts in terms of speed. So how, when your foot hits the ground, how quickly can you develop that force to push off and get from initial contact to push off? And actually, that's one of the things that um, you found in your systematic review is that rate of force development decreases in masters runners, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So the whole idea with lower reps, higher weight is that you're really targeting that rate of force development system, if you will. Right. And it's the same thing with anything that we suggest. If this is something you're going to put into your program, we highly suggest if you have a coach, talk to your coach first. If you're yep. seeing a professional, talk to them first. And as anything, you're going to want to ease into it because just like some other stuff, it takes a little bit more time to get used to this. So ease into it. Right. And if you and... take the time to do that, you're going to see those benefits. If you go too quick. Yep. You know, and so. also maybe don't do it like a month before your marathon or yeah. before your goal race. Like this is something good to start in like your base building period yeah. so that you're not stressing your system too right. much with both strength work and yeah. a lot of running. Um, I think something else important to talk about is you had mentioned it before were strides and hill sprints and how those can be men- beneficial hmm. for, um, masters athletes. I mean, they're good for everybody, but they, are. Yeah. they can, they've been found to improve or help maintain VO2 max. They can actually be used as like a type of strength, like functional strength work, particularly short, steep hill sprints. Um, there are a number of well-known coaches who they really incorporate that into their programs. So, you know, some people say, oh, I hate hills. I don't want to go do hill sprints. But like if you really either don't have time or really don't want to do heavy weightlifting, if you can at least incorporate short, steep hill sprints into your routine two times a week, you will get some of the benefits of heavy strength training. Yeah, there's some good evidence for that. I, I don't think anything's been done in older runners, but definitely like across the spectrum of, of some different ages that we've seen. Yeah, that's a really big thing. And I, I, I don't know if you ever heard, you probably heard this, but I, my coaches always used to say hills are strength training in disguise. Right. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. That was not that. No, it's I totally messed it up. It's hills are speed work in disguise. Oh, yes. I've heard but both, kind of, actually. Okay. Yeah. Good. I didn't mess it up well, with the first one. Yeah. 
Because when you sprint up a hill, you're getting, you're working your cardiovascular system in a similar way to doing speed work. Right. But because you're going uphill, you're not getting the same loading on your joints right. that you would if you were sprinting yeah. on flat ground. So a lot of coaches will use hill sprints as a way to introduce speed yeah. without the greater load on the musculoskeletal system. You still have to be a little careful though, because that inc that that incline does put more yeah. stress on the Achilles tendon and calf. So it's one of those things. Right. Again, these are good, but like any new stimulus, you need to ease into them, yeah. and you also need to make sure you're introducing it at the right time. You know, I I right. totally didn't know about that as a new grad, and I'd be like, oh, we're gonna start on this stuff now, and you've got your marathon in a week. It's like, okay, don't do that, right? This is like <laughs> no. a, all right, because that could injure someone. It's yes. just like mm -hmm. do this don't start this crazy stuff right before a big race or right before a bunch of like hard workouts. It's ease this in when your body's ready for it and can actually handle that increase. Cause it's going to increase this, the load on your body. Right. right. But you got to yeah. make sure your body's got the ability to recover from it. Cause if you don't recover from it, you're either going to get injured or you're gonna, not going to adapt to it. Yeah. So Matt, you know, a question that I get often is, okay, I'm going to add strength work into my mm -hmm. routine. Well, when should I do it? Should I do it? The same day I do like oh, interval interval work, should I do it on a rest day? Um, I definitely prefer doing it the same day as yeah. like an interval day, but afterwards. Right. How about you? Um, I generally suggest it afterward. I I prefer doing it on like day of of, of workouts, but later on, just because yeah. doing it beforehand, it can affect your run, right? Not so you're going to get injured, but it can definitely make you feel like, ah, I'm not running. Yeah. I'm like sore. I'm not feeling good. <laughs> so generally after most runs, um, would be better and definitely not the day before a hard workout, because right. if you're going to be doing that now, you haven't really recovered fully. You've added a different stimulus in. So oftentimes after workouts carefully can be really good or like in yeah. during a base phase where you're not actually doing any hard workouts, right? If you're just yeah. running normally, that's the perfect time to add it in. Just don't be surprised if you're Definitely. a little sore the yes. next day. Right. But all the more reason to actually run slowly the next day. Yes. To Sometimes help you recover. Forces you to do that. Yeah. I'm sore. <laughs> so besides the so we've talked about the strength changes associated mm -hmm. with age. We've talked about the biomechanical changes associated with age. Um how about recovery time? Mm -hmm. Have you read anything about like is there is there any sort of quantification about like as a runner gets into their 50s or 60s how much more recovery do they need? Are there some athletes who would maybe benefit from being on like a 10-day uh training plan instead of like a 7-day? I I think to be honest, so I'm trying to think off the top of my head. I haven't I haven't seen that in the literature. I've seen it just a lot as like coaches and those who are well versed in training suggest that. And not mm -hmm. just for older individuals, the 10 day training cycle has been gaining more traction because seven days really doesn't oftentimes allow you enough recovery. And the rec again, right. we've talked about this before that you only get better from stimuli, whether it's a workout or whatever, you only get better during the recovery period. So doesn't matter your age. It sounds like sometimes people need more recovery than they give their bodies. And when you Definitely. push that envelope and you don't give yourself enough recovery, that's where you might see an injury pop up. Plus some yeah. added stress or lack of sleep or poor nutrition. You can amplify that a little bit. But I haven't, I'm sh I wonder if there is, I haven't directly looked at that. Do you mm -hmm. know of any? No, but you know, you think about like, we've got all these wearables now and mm -hmm. biometrics. So I'll, one of the most popular metrics for helping to gauge recovery is HRV, heart mm -hmm. rate variability. So I don't think there's enough data to say, okay, if your HRV has decreased by this percentage from your average, then that's a sign that you need another recovery day. But I think most coaches would encourage runners to at least become familiar with their daily HRV readings and to start seeing patterns. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that's kind of frustrating for females is that our HRV is affected by our, our cycle. So you will see your HRV go up and down based on what time of the month it is. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you need another recovery day. It's just what your hormones are doing. But if you, just like anything, like 
some athletes are used to tracking their resting heart rate. HRV can actually be an even better measure of recovery. But if you notice that, you know, your HRV always stays between like, let's say 50 and 80, and all of a sudden you've had three days where it's 30, that might be a sign that you're either not recovering, getting sick, not sleeping enough, and maybe you need to take a couple of recovery days. Um, what do you like? How do you know when you need an extra recovery day, Matt? Just based on feel, or do you use a lot of data? You know, it's funny as a PhD student you, or candidate, you think I would. I I <laughs> don't use a lot of data. I was the person. Uh -huh. I'm going to admit this out loud, and I hope my coach never listens to this, but he used to tell us, hey, you need to take your heart rate every morning, and I would lie to him every single time because I, <laughs> I didn't want him to tell me not to do the workout. <laughs> to this day, I still don't take my heart rate. I mean, even though yeah. I've got – I could look on it. I've got Koros that will tell me it. I still got – I don't want to know. Right. Um, but my body will definitely tell me, and yeah. that's kind of the same thing I've heard from a lot of the really awesome, like, competitive Masters runners that I know mm -hmm. is they just know, like – and when you have a little bit more maturity, you you know, like, you know what? I'm going to save this for another day. It's right. really not worth yeah. it. I don't have to hit X work on X day. I'm going to get in what I can get in. And it's, so it's it's really feel. And there's been plenty of days going, I'm not doing this today. Yeah. Uh, you know, or if if I'm if my wife is really pushing it, I'm like, I'm going to sandbag this workout. I'm going to be just jogging this. I'm going to get my run in. She, uh, she'll get a win and think she beat me. It's I'll let it go. It's fine. <laughs> It's very chivalrous. Hopefully she, doesn't, <laughs> hopefully she doesn't listen to this. Um, but no, it's, it's having the maturity to go, you know what? I'm not feeling this. And it's pattern recognition to go, oh, I right. felt like this before. And yep. this is different from just, oh, I'm going to warm up through this. This is a mm, body's not having this. And yeah. I need to listen because I know what happens when I over push this. And that's hard. It's hard to figure out what's that like, oh, my body just hasn't warmed up yet kind of feeling. Yeah. Or then you have like a mm -hmm. great workout versus the I'm dead and this is going to get worse. Right. It, it takes some learning and it takes some mistakes and you'll figure it out. Right. And yeah, it also it's my takes... Feel. Yeah. It definitely also takes some maturity to say to yourself, okay, this is not going well and I'm just going to stop today. Yeah. And tomorrow is another day. Tomorrow is another usually, day. I yeah. usually, because, you know, as I've gotten older, I definitely need a longer warm up. So I yep. usually give myself the first couple of reps of my workout to see how I feel. Because yeah. I usually don't feel awesome during my warm up, so I don't expect to. But yeah. if I've warmed up properly, then I should feel good for my first interval, if not the yeah. second. But if by the second one, still feeling like, hmm, this just isn't, you know, I'm slow, this feels harder than it should. Yeah. You're much better off just pulling the plug than yeah. fighting through it and either getting sick or getting an injury. Um, and hopefully, you know, the longer somebody is a runner, the better you get at listening to your body, but not everybody does. And I think there's also like a big culture in running and other sports where it's like, oh, just suffer through it. Like it's supposed to be hard, do it anyway. But I think the best athletes and the ones who are maybe a little less likely to get injured are better at say at knowing when it's okay to quit. Right. And it's like, again, I wouldn't even use the word quit. It's just like knowing when it's time to kind of go, you know what, say this. It's funny right. you said, like, I feel great on the first rep and then the second rep. Sometimes I'm like, I don't feel good, like halfway decent to like third or fourth rep. Sometimes I'm like, ah, this is just me. I know this just sucks. Then yeah. It starts to warm up. But you just have to know that about yourself. And people want right. the answer right now. It's like, now there's some learning to figure out who you are what yeah. your body kind of responds to. And you just got to take, just like we talk about shoes, right? Everybody wants to know what's the best shoe. It's like, you got to figure that out for you. And yep. this is exactly the same thing. There are some kind of guidelines, right? There are some things you might want to pay attention to. There are some general ideas, but you know what? This might be a good idea. This might not be a good idea, but it's also going to be specific to you. I'd also like to point out, cause you were talking about, there are some, there are some, a couple specific needs to masters runners that have been seen. Um, first of all, nutrition wise, there is some evidence that a little extra protein supplementation can go a long way. And it doesn't mean yes. you have to get like, like 
chug an entire container of protein powder, but just a little bit extra can go a long way towards facilitating recovery, regardless of gender. Now, there are some other things that you were that you kind of alluded to earlier. Is there anything you need to pay attention to in the menopause or post-menopause uh, transition? Um, so as far as nutrition goes, definitely, and I'm glad you brought that up. When we had uh, Celine Yeager, the co-author of Roar with Stacey mm. Sims on the podcast, and Jen Giles, our awesome uh, RD who has contributed so much to the site, um, one of the things we talked about a lot was increased protein needs and specifically taking protein at night, like an hour or two before bed, because that's where your body is most able to actually take those amino acids and help your muscles recover. It has to do with when, um, growth hormone spikes, it's when we're sleeping and growth hormone helps us use those amino acids to repair muscles. Um, the other things for people in the menopause transition and postmenopausal is as our hormones decrease, it does unfortunately um, predispose us to losing lean muscle mass. So like all of the things that we talked about regarding the importance of strength training is like triply important as women get older, because unfortunately when we have decreased estrogen levels, it really affects our ability to maintain muscle mass. And of course that affects our strength, our endurance, it affects our weight, our metabolism. So women, you know, I would say 35 and up, if you're not strength training and like lifting heavy, actually, you really, really need to consider, strongly consider adding it to your program. And I was just reading something interesting that the best time to start a heavy list lifting program is actually not when you're like postmenopausal. It's actually when you're like 40 so that you can, or earlier, of course, but when you start like early in like the menopause transition, when maybe your hormones are starting to decline slightly, that's when you can like prevent that lean muscle mass loss because you're working on it so early when you still have, you know, decent hormone levels. Now, those who are panicking right now going, oh my gosh, I didn't start this. Just so you know, you can still get those strength benefits yes. regardless of what age that you start. It's so never too late. <laughs> it is never too late. Like I said earlier, we have seen individuals into their late 90s and early hundreds yep. from some of the literature adapt and increase their lean muscle mass, increase their strength, and even increase their power yep. as they get older. So, but it, it's, it's better to start earlier, but there's again, never too late of a time. And I kind of want to touch on that last little piece. It's a very interesting thing that the that, that phenomenon we don't really understand. So yes, protein intake is very, very important. Do you need to be taking a thousand grams? No, right. I really encourage you to talk to your registered dietitian if that's yep. something you're interested in about how to supplement that optimally. But for whatever reason, we lose muscle mass as normally as we get older, we lose more strength relative to our muscle mass, and we lose more power relative to the strength loss. We don't know why this is happening, but I would say if you can start at that ground level and go, hey, try to maintain some of that muscle mass, or if you even gain a little bit, it's going to be really good down the line because we oh, actually yeah. know that power actually has – power and strength training actually have the biggest impact on – your function, right? right. Whether you're, yeah. you know, a non-active 80 year old or a, you know, high, like, like national, like Olympic or not Olympic level, or maybe like high level <laughs> 80 or whoever. Right. So it's, it is really important. That's why we are suggesting that kind of the carefully go talk to, if you're nervous, talk to a professional, ease in this stuff, but some of those higher strength training stuff can be really helpful. Now, do you need to be doing power lifts and like throwing stuff over your head? No, even though I've got a couple of people in their 80s that I work with that still are doing that on a national level, which I still don't understand why they reached out to me. Like, I'm a runner, and you can put up more than I ever can. But, hey, it's fun to work with them. So it doesn't <laughs> matter true. what age you are. You can do that stuff. Do you necessarily need to do that level as a runner? No, right? Yeah. Something simple, right? Simple is right. better. Do something yes. you're going to do. That's why I only do 15, 20 minutes a couple of times a week because it's doable. I'm going to maintain it. Yeah. So. You know, even a simple deadlift exercise, right? Kind of working on your form, getting a little heavier weight, doing a couple squats, right? As far down as you're comfortable doing some single leg calf raises. You can do the single leg versions. 
You know, it's just do something you're going to keep doing. Don't choose a billion exercises. Choose two or three things going, you know what? Here's the muscle groups I want to work on. Boom. Keep it simple. Yep. Yeah. It's better to do two days a week of 15 minutes than to do nothing at all because you think that you have to do three days a week of 60 minutes. Yeah. And make it easy. Like I, where my office now at West Coast, where I'm teaching, um, I, there was an awesome deal on Amazon and I, no, this is not, we're not sponsored by Amazon. So that wasn't an advertisement, but, um, I found there was a really great deal on 50 pound kettlebells and I bought two of them and didn't really think that through and had to walk from the parking lot all the way through with carrying hundred pounds. And I'm sitting there sweating the security guard. Marcus like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm just walking like 400 meters with a hundred pounds. It's okay. Yeah. But hey, it was a great workout, and I've got two 50-pound kettlebells in my office that, you know, when I need a break, I can go mess with those for a little bit. But yeah, just make it easy. Make it fun. Make it make it something you're willing to do, and you'd look forward to rather going, oh, God, I have to do this. Next, when you get too strong for your 50-pound kettlebells, yeah. and you're going to have to carry your 60-pounders into Ugh. your office. I yeah. did carry it this, uh, the 70, I did carry a 75-pound one, because there was also a deal, and I'm like, sure, I'm going to invest in this. <laughs> That one wasn't as bad, but it was still terrible having like 75 pounds. One hour, it was like, break. Switch yes. to the other side, break. It's like, <laughs> like, I've only been there like three weeks. They're probably like, what the heck is wrong with this guy? Yeah, <laughs> this runner guy is What else is he weird. bringing in? Yeah. What else is he going to bring in here? Like, <laughs> we're just going to drag in here. I'm just going to drag a squat rack next. Just just on the ground. I can't lift it off the ground. So I'm just going to tear your floors up. Let us know how that goes, Matt. Uh, Yeah, they probably probably won't fit through the hallway, but no, we have one upstairs. Just know we need to get some weights. Yeah. Anything else from your research, Matt, that you think our listeners should know about just how to maintain or build strength as they get older? Um, any other wisdom you found in all the studies you read? I would say kind of the classic that the more you read, the more you learn, we're like, how can we just try to simplify this stuff? And I think it really, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening, but to distill it all down, I would say if you are getting older, whether you're an athlete, a runner or not, let's just out runners or athletes. I don't know why I said that. Um, if you are someone that is active or not, you should be working on your strength in some manner. Right, doesn't have to be fancy. In fact, I'd actually encourage you to keep it simple. But whether that's doing hill repeats, right, carefully added in, whether that's going, hey, I'm going to do some single leg weighted calf raises or single leg deadlifts or you know squats, something like that. Just do a little something because a little goes a long way. And we found it actually doesn't take that much to make right. some physiologic and musculoskeletal changes. So don't think you got to like become a professional powerlifter. Just do a little bit of something. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. how I treat too. Is like, I'm just like, do, do the least amount necessary to get through it. Right. You don't have right. to become this expert in this thing. Just, you know, just add it in. Like just kind of right. like brushing your teeth. The body, body responds to new challenges and it doesn't yeah. have to be a big challenge. It just no. has to be something slightly different and right. harder. Right. Sometimes the big challenges can cause some other issues. So it's like, just, right. just a little bit little bit yeah so we hope this didn't scare you hope it was educational but again that's one of the things that i think both myself andrew you can attest to this i'll try well trying to go hey you know what we have to become pts because we want to try to figure out what's happening to us and we want to share yep. that with others so this is what we're learning and the goal is not to scare you but to go hey you know what this is everybody you know runners tend to hate straight training but here's a good reason why to work on it because it's literally this thing that's going to save you so Definitely. it might be good to add that in a little bit what that looks like for you is going to be totally different but we hope that was helpful. We appreciate you listening. One thing that would be helpful back to us is that on whatever medium you are watching or listening this to on, we'd really appreciate if you'd leave a review. So whether it's Spotify, whether it's any of the podcast websites, whether it's on you know YouTube, what, where have you, wherever, please you know subscribe, leave a review. It really really helps us out, and it really helps get the word out here because we're just trying to share good information, right? So we hope that was helpful. Andrew, anything else from you? Finishing up. No, in addition, you know, we've talked a ton about strength, yeah. but I would say in addition to strength training, one of the biggest improvements for me as a almost masters runner is incorporating more protein in my diet. Like I do the night protein thing and I think it's helped me tremendously in yep. increasing my mileage, being able to tolerate marathon training. So, you know, look at your diet and same thing. You don't have to 
overhaul your whole diet, just ask yourself, am I getting enough protein for what is recommended for my age and activity level? And if you're not, figure out a way to add a little bit more in. It could be a powder, it could be from real food, but just making small changes to your diet can tremendously improve how you feel, not only when you're running, but in general. Yep. So just do your best to do kind of the minor changes you need to make, to kind of get become more well-rounded. Because again, that's one of the things as you get older, there's kind of, you don't, you can't quite get away with as much, but you know, it's not worth getting away with that stuff. So take the time to really become well-rounded, whether it's well-rounded as an athlete, well-rounded in nutrition. It's yep. just time to optimize things. That's all it is. So we hope that was hope that was helpful. Again, if you can help us out, please leave us a review or subscribe. We've got a lot of cool stuff coming, so it's, it's well worth sticking around. We got some really exciting shoes that I'm trying not to get distracted with because Bach is sending photos at the moment of a shoe that I've been waiting for a while. But we have lots of stuff coming. We've got some really cool interviews coming up soon. So stick around, leave us a review, subscribe, and check back soon.